All right, so gotta say, today's deep dive, it's a little different. We're not exactly sifting through like mountains of research. You know, this is someone's personal notes, their dog-eared copy of Meditations, Marcus Aurelius, and let me tell you, they did not hold back. It's refreshing, actually. We're not talking, you know, detach academic analysis here this person took these ancient stoic ideas wrestled with them tried to use them in their own life and uh well let's just say their enthusiasm is uh obvious let's put it that way in the margins especially okay gotta circle back to that the word they use not your typical philosophy fan huh but first things first for anyone needing a little like context who was this marcus aurelius guy oh he wasn't just some like influencer with a scroll imagine right being a roman emperor second century a.d talk about stress mm -hmm. but also being super into philosophy running an empire all responsibilities and still making time to think about like virtue duty living a good life that was marcus aurelius it's like, I don't know, being the CEO of Dot Everything, but you still meditate and journal about it. Casual. So, 10 years worth of this person's thoughts on meditations. Where do we even start? Well, they begin by sharing these really takeaways, right? Which, honestly, it's relatable, especially if you're new to meditations. They were drawn to those passages about action, carpe diem, that, you know, classic self-help energy. Right, like you finish a book, you're fired up, ready to, like, conquer your inbox, yeah. but then, you know, life. <laughs> <laughs> your roommate uses your favorite mug as like a change jar. Precisely. And that's where it gets interesting. See, as this reader kept coming back to meditations over the years, their focus thought it shifted. Yeah. They started highlighting stuff about tranquility, about doing less, not more. Like there's this one quote they underlined, if you seek tranquility, do less. It suggests a move away from that, you know, initial drive to always be doing, doing, doing towards something more balanced, maybe. What do you think prompted that shift as their life went on? Makes you wonder what they were going through, right? What made those particular words hit home? And honestly, it makes me think, how often do WE do that? Cling to that first aha from a book, but our understanding, it doesn't evolve with us. That's such a good point. This wasn't some static thing, their journey with meditations. Their understanding grew. And they started actively using specific passages in their own life, dealing with difficult roommates, career stuff, all through that stoic lens. Okay, yeah, spill it. How does ancient philosophy help with like a roommate who's allergic to dish soap? Asking for a friend, obviously. So picture this, right? Readers living with these people, right? Yeah. Frustration is building. They turn to meditations and they've highlighted passages like, do not hate them and remain aloof. Not in a you know cold way, but as a way to keep your inner peace, even when surrounded by chaos. That's low key genius. The dishes can't steal your stoic chill. I dig it. But what about bigger things? Career setbacks, disappointments, we've all been there. This person found guidance there too. Facing career stuff, right, they underlined, why do I care what these people think again? It's such a good reminder. Your worth, it doesn't come from needing everyone else's approval. Have you ever felt that pressure though, to prove yourself? Oh, 100%. It's like Marcus Aurelius is, I don't know, whispering across the centuries, you got this, focus on what you can control. Hearing that even from like, an emperor from forever ago. Right. It's weirdly validating. Right, it's so easy to get caught up in that. And what I love about works like meditations is they remind you, validation yeah. has to start internally. But you know, this deep dive, it's not just about how this person used meditations in their life, but the ripple effects it had, you know, on yeah. everything. It's like that saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. But here it's more like, a whole faculty of teachers experiences all because of this one book exactly and they even talk about how like meditations opened the door to other writers they discovered william alexander percy might never have found him otherwise now he's a favorite it's the best right when one book sends you down this rabbit hole have you had that happen oh yeah all the time best part of reading <laughs> but it's even better our reader actually credits meditations with a get this a romantic connection wait hold up okay gotta hear about the stoic love story details please so the way they tell it, they were sharing a copy of Meditations, led to deeper conversations, thinking about shared values, and boom, relationship. It really shows you, right, how powerful shared ideas can be, even for, like, sparking a connection. No kidding. Who knew ancient philosophy was a wingman? But we did call this 10 years with Marcus Aurelius for a reason. What did that actually look like? I'm guessing they weren't just, like, curled up with it on the couch every night? Not even close. Huh. This is where it gets really interesting. Our reader goes deep on like the practical side of stoic exercises, using them in daily life tools. One technique they're big on, they call it contemptuous expressions. Contemptuous expressions? Mm. That sounds a little 
intense for self-help, doesn't it? Oh, it's not about being negative or anything. More about getting clear perspective. They talk about how Marcus Aurelius would like break down these idealized things. Fancy food, expensive stuff, roasted meat. Nope, a dead animal. Expensive wine, old fermented grapes. Take away the fancy labels, you're less likely to be swayed by, you know, just wanting stuff. It's seeing things for what they are, stripped down. It's like a reality check, but in your brain. Next time I see some gadget I need, I'm picturing it like that wires, plastic, way less tempting. <laughs> it's like that line from Fight Club, you are not your khakis. <laughs> <laughs> so good. What other uh, stoic practices did they mention? They talk a lot about having an inner scorecard. They credit that to Warren Buffett, actually. Yeah, so, yeah. like, focusing on what you think of your success, not needing external validations, other people's yardsticks. Think about it. How often are we letting other people decide our worth? Dude, all the time. Social media especially makes it so easy to get caught up in comparing yourself. I love that, though. Inner scorecard. So empowering. Great takeaway. Right. And he gets at that stoic core, right? Mm -hmm. You control what you can control. Your actions, your thoughts. Freedom from the rest of it. And that connects to another stoic idea the reader highlights. Stuff cannot touch the soul. It's about remembering. Real peace, real freedom, it's internal. Not stuff you own or what happens to you. Building that inner resilience to deal with whatever. It's so cool how they took these old ideas and made them work for their life, you know? But after a decade with this, with meditations, where did they end up? What was the final takeaway? Yeah, it really makes you think, huh. You spend years with something, a book, a philosophy, a whole way of looking at things. Does it actually change you? Big question, right? Our reader, they had this realization that like at a certain point, you got to put the book down and, you know, look. they'd spent a decade with Marcus Aurelius's words, but to actually change, they had to actually do something with them. That's the tricky part, right? Walk yeah. the walk, all that. I know I've been there, got all the knowledge, but actually putting it into practice. Yeah. Harder than it sounds. Yeah, totally. It's tough to bridge that gap insight to action. But what I like about this whole deep dive is it shows you how it can happen. It's not about being some perfect stoic, but constantly trying to, I don't know, live by the principles that speak to you. And it seems like they found a pretty unique way to do that, to keep those ideas front and center. Remember how they mentioned having like an actual bust of Marcus Aurelius mm. on their desk? Not just the book hidden away, but this like visual reminder isn't that wild it really drives home the point making these principles real not just something you think about once in a while it's like a challenge to all of us what could we have as that tangible reminder of what matters to us you know doesn't have to be a roman emperor bust right but maybe it's a quote on your bathroom mirror or a piece of art that speaks to you or even just some object something meaningful that reminds you of the way you want to live that's it finding what works for you, what keeps those values front of mind while you're out there dealing with life. That's what this deep dive is really asking, you know? How did WE walk that path? Knowledge into action. So how do we do it? Not just from this conversation, but from everything. How do we turn it all into a life well lived? The million dollar question. It is. And I don't know if there's one right answer, but mm -hmm. maybe it's approaching it all with that same you know, open mind, that curiosity, that willingness to learn that a reader brought to meditations. If we can do that, mm. who knows what we'll find. What a journey, right? From F-bombs scribbled in a philosophy book to like actual life lessons, even a stoic romance. This deep dive into 10 years with Marcus Aurelius just goes to show you the classics are classics for a reason. There's wisdom there you can use, argue with, grow with for years and years. Couldn't agree more. And hey, Maybe this will inspire some folks listening to take their own deep dive. To everyone listening, we want to hear from you. What would your tangible reminder be? Something to think about as we wrap up this episode. Marcus Aurelius, he ruled with grace. Stoic wisdom all up in his face. Oh yeah. Kept his cool through the Roman storm. With a calm that was fire, man was born to reform. He said, mind your kingdom, so take the throne. In a peace, that's where seeds are sown. Uh, when life's heavy, don't be rattled. Keep your crew steady, never be battled. Trials, he'd never fold. No way. 
A simple thank you is all that is necessary. It would make everyone feel a lot better. Of course, self-image manifests itself in the way we handle our personal lives. You tell a youngster with a poor self-image that he ought to stay away from drugs, they'll kill you. And his response, at least internally, many times is, don't tell me that. My friends tell me that they make you feel good make you feel big. Besides, suppose they're not good for me. What difference does it make? I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. Got nothing to lose. Person with a good self-image would not respond in any such manner. You tell a youngster to study for his lessons and obey the law if he's got a poor self-image, many times they're so negative they say it won't do me any good. You know, the deck's already stacked. I came the wrong side of the tracks. The rich kids are going to get all of their breaks. Why shouldn't I have a little fun right now? You'd say to a youngster with a poor self-image, you really ought to save yourself for marriage. And their instant thinking is, who's going to marry me? What chance have I got? Why not I have a little fun now? That's what it's all about. My peer group tells me I've got to do these things to be accepted. Since I have nothing to lose, why not go ahead? An individual with a poor self-image is jealous without cause. Now, I'm not talking about jealousy for cause. Ladies, if he comes in smelling like joy and lipstick all over his collar, uh, jealousy is not a manifestation of a poor self-image. That has nothing to do with it. But some people say, you know, oh, I just love him so much I can't let him out of my sight. Or I just love her so much I don't want her out of my sight. What they're really saying is I don't understand why this person married me. Roads were made for journeys, not destinations. To have what you never had, you have to do what you never did. Kindness is invincible. Marcus Aurelius. Be selfish with your time. Who dares nothing needs hope for nothing. You don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. Les Brown. An angry countenance is much against nature, and it is oftentimes the proper countenance of them that are at the point of death. But were it so, that all anger and passion were so thoroughly quenched in thee, that it were altogether impossible to kindle it any more, yet herein must not thou rest satisfied, but further endeavor by good consequence of true ratiocination, perfectly to conceive and understand that all anger and passion is against reason. For if thou shalt not be sensible of thine innocence, if that also shall be gone from thee, the comfort of a good conscience, that thou doest all things according to reason, what shouldest thou live any longer for? All things that now thou seest are but for a moment. That nature, by which all things in the world are administered, will soon bring change and alteration upon them, and then of their substances make other things like unto them, and then soon after others again of the matter and substance of these, that so by these means the world may still appear fresh and new. One more time. Land of the, but the home of the, you might have missed it.
You've been singing it for a long time. You're not paying attention. It is definitely the land of the, but it's only the home of the. The American dream is real, but they're not passing it out. They're not giving it away. It's real, but you got to go get it. All right, do me a favor. Let's go. Stop complaining. You don't have time. 168 hours per week. 48 hours at work, seven hours at the gym, 56 hours of sleep, 65 hours left. You do all of this right here. You still got 65 hours left. Act today. Use your time wisely. Mental toughness is about what you do when you're under stress and you're under pressure. I told y'all, Mike Tyson, I've never seen Mike Tyson lose but once, and he lost to a buster. Imagine Mike Tyson, your first loss is to a buster. I want to lose to Zeus, Hercules. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I got beat by Hercules. Can't nobody say nothing about that. But you got beat by a buster. And that buster never won another fight. But you know why buster beat Mike Tyson? Because three days before he fought Mike Tyson, Mama was in the beauty salon bragging about how his son was Mike Tyson. Buster Douglas, how did you do it? He said he hurt me when he knocked me down, but that pain I felt when he knocked me down was not greater than the pain I would have felt if I let my mama down. On the great days, be great. And on the bad days, be greater. If the world was blind, how many people would you impress? Early to bed and early to rise in old age makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. As a well-spent day brings happy sleep, a life well-spent brings happy death. Leonardo da Vinci It is not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. We learn not in school, but in life. All truly great thoughts are conceived while walking. Friedrich Nietzsche, Twilight of the Idols. When someone treats you badly or says bad things about you, remember that they do or say these things because they think it is appropriate. This is because it is not possible for someone to act on how things appear to you, but on how things appear to them. Accordingly, if someone has a wrong opinion, because this is the person who has been deceived, it is they who suffer the harm. In the same way, if someone supposes that a true conjunction is false, it is not the conjunction that is harmed, but the person who has been deceived. If you proceed, then, from these principles, you will be gentle with the person who abuses you, saying on all such occasions, to them, this is how it seems. Venus brings up the possibility of failure. It takes discipline to admit our errors and recognize our limitations. The voice of the human ego speaks to all of us. Sometimes the voice of ego says that we should magnify our value beyond our results. It leads us to exaggerate, to not be totally honest. It takes discipline to be totally honest, both with ourselves and with others. It takes discipline to change a habit. Because habits are formed a little bit each day, every day, every day. Once habits are formed, they act like a giant cable. They act like a nearly unbreakable instinct that only long-term disciplined activity can change. You just got to go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do? that could greatly change my health, my wealth. What am I not doing I'm neglecting that would be easy to do? 
Just go home and answer that question personally. You don't have to put the answers on a public bulletin board. This is just all personal stuff. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done, postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. It'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, well, my mother lives down in Florida. Should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter written, clean that up, and don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing